I guess if I gave you, if I gave you this triangle, give me, uh, if I tell you that this angle here is theta, what do you know of that angle right there to be? Okay, which would be 90 minus theta. Combine like terms and you're right. Uh, I'm going to call this A, B, and this C. What is the sine of theta for that triangle? A over C. Okay. What would the sine? Oh, let's do this. Let's, what would be the uh, the cosine of the ninety minus theta? A over C, right? A over C. What do you notice about that A over C and that A over C? Same. So that means the sine of theta is the same as the cosine of ninety minus theta, right? And we've seen this before where I give you sine of 30 degrees and you say, well, that's the same as the cosine of 60 degrees, right? We've seen individual statements like that, okay? That's, a, that's a, actually a geometry standard that we covered in geometry. Now, maybe we didn't, we were probably more specifically talked about it that way uh, instead of using theta and 90 minus theta, but that is a relationship that is 100% true. The unit circle verifies that. Uh, I want to talk about how our sine and cosine curves verify that, okay? So if I take, uh, let's just deal with the sine function here real quick. So I go sine of x, and I go cosine of x, okay? Uh, what can I do? So let's take cosine of x, and I actually move it to the right or left. Um, it, it will eventually become the sine, correct? Well, yeah. Okay. Now, if this is the, so the cosine starts like right there, right? How far to the right do I need to move it so that it becomes the sine? Where does it start? Starts there. I heard, I heard somebody say pi over 2. Pi over 2 is the correct answer. So that, so if I take, let's go back to this. Let's take a, uh, So basically what I'm asking, and I know there's a lot of points there, basically what I'm asking is how far does A need to move to the right so it becomes F? That's pi over 2, right? Okay. So let's do this real quick. Let's take the cosine. Uh, give myself a little bit of room here, right? Uh, let's take the cosine. And move it, we're moving it to the right, correct? So when I move it to the right, the transformation has to occur to the x, right? And it's to the right, so it has to be subtraction. And I'm going to go pi over 2, right? Yeah. That should generate, that. when I move that maroon curve, it should land on the gray one, right? And the gray one we know to be sine, okay? Now, what's pi over 2 as a degree? 90, okay? This does not look like what we had a moment ago with the triangle, right? The triangle said the cosine of 90 minus x was equal to sine of x, right? Okay? So I guess we use state over there. Let's see if we can maybe manipulate this a little bit uh, using our identities and our properties to see if we can change this to 90 minus x. 
Okay, and it simply comes from creating a, a convenient factor here, dividing out a convenient factor of negative 1. If I divide a negative 1 out of this uh, quantity, what's x divided by negative 1? Negative x, right? What's negative pi over 2 divided by negative 1? Positive pi over 2. Okay, so I get something like that, correct? That should equal the sine of x. Okay. Do you guys remember our even odd properties that said the cosine of negative x was identical to the cosine of positive x? That was the unit circle type thing. If, and we used t at that point. But if I'm going to say, like the, let's say pi over 3, the cosine of pi over 3, is that the same x value as the cosine of negative pi over 3? Yeah. Okay. So that relationship is true. Okay. Now, this set of parentheses right here, that's one quantity. That's essentially just that x right there. Does that make sense? Okay. So can I ultimately get rid of, if, if I'm viewing that thing right there as my, maybe instead of using x's here because I got too many x's, let's use t here. Okay, so the set in parentheses is the t, and I've got the opposite of t then. Is it okay there, everybody? Well, the opposite of t just turns into cosine of t. So let's just rewrite this as the cosine of negative x plus pi over 2, which was just the t, right? So then, can I flip-flop those? Can I use the commutative property to rewrite that? So now I have cosine of pi over 2 minus x equals sine of x. What's pi over 2 as a degree? 90. Is that then, you know, obviously using x or theta, is that the same thing that our triangles told us? Yeah, okay. So the relation, and this is the, 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 the interesting thing, I think, about trig, and, and really why we're investigating trig to see these connections uh, to use some of the algebra, you, if you remember me telling you at the beginning, yeah, there's some things in trig that you'll never use outside of trig. But a byproduct of it is that you develop algebraic skills, uh, you refine those algebraic skills uh, that you will undoubtedly use outside of trig. Okay? Um, this is one of those things. Okay? Um, but why, why are we talking about this? The reason I want to talk about this is because when we graph these things, when I take uh, the sine function, and, and I can have any sine function that I want, okay, any transformation of it, I can actually rewrite it as um, something written in terms of cosine. Does that make sense? That's not something you can always do, right? And, and the polynomial functions that we've talked about uh, in the root functions and the logarithmic and exponential functions we talk about in college algebra, you could not do this. If I ask you to graph x squared, you have to use x and you have to square, right? There's one and only one way to write that equation. Here, we've got multiple ways of writing the same thing, okay? Um, now, we can also, you know, I could take those and lingo, cosine of, you know, even just type it in, what I had earlier when I had the negative, uh, actually, let's do it this way real quick. We'll go, so does it, does it make sense that I can flip-flop those and write x minus pi over 2? Still gives me the same graph, right? Okay. Um, we can go cosine of negative, negative x plus pi over 2, same graph, okay? But any one of those, I can take and add 2 pi to. So let's take this one and add 2 pi. So it would give me a 5 pi or 2, right? Did it produce the same graph? Okay, nothing new up there, so it must be the same graph, right? Um, add another 2 pi. So what's that, 9 pi or 2? Same graph, okay? So there are, when I give you a question in homework, when I say, here is a graph, let me give you, let's do this one real quick. I'm going to freeze it so you can't see it. 
You can't see what I'm typing in. Um, if I give you that curve and I ask you to write an equation for it, okay, let's talk about how we can come up with an equation for this graph. Okay. What I like to do is I like to put, um, so this is kind of the reverse of what we were doing yesterday. Yesterday they gave us the equation, we write the graph, right? Okay, I draw the graph. Here we draw, they give us the graph, we're going to convert it to an equation. Um, when I'm doing this, I like to always keep in my mind, and it might make sense to sketch them briefly, the sine function and the cosine function, just the parent graphs. Okay. Yes. Uh, we might. If not, you can stay after and I'll answer it. Um, so that's the sine, that's the cosine, yes? All right. Which one of those does this graph here resemble the most? Or which one do you think it looks like the most? Okay, so I, I think it looks like this. There's, there's no wrong answer to that. It's kind of almost a trick question. But I think it looks like the sign. Why do you think this looks like the sign, Blaze? What would you do to this sign to get this curve here? Because the sign starts going positive, right? Starts to increase. What's this one doing? Decreasing, right? So you would probably say y equals, you said sign, but it's going to decrease first. So that means this had to be flipped down like that, right? So if it's flipped down, what, what does that? A negative out front, right? Okay. Now, what is the sine value? What is the, the normal or the parent function? What is the range on the sine function? Right. Yeah, so it goes from negative 1 to positive 1, right? Okay. But this is going from negative 2 to positive 2, right? Just 2. Okay. The, the formula for finding, if you want a formula, is at the, and this is one of those videos I asked you to watch when I was gone, the amplitude um, is found by taking the absolute value of your max minus your min divided by 2. Okay, so we go 2 minus negative 2, that would give me 4, right? 4 divided by 2 gives me 2. Um, and then... The period here is 0 to 2 pi. Would you guys agree that after 2 pi, it starts repeating itself? Yeah. So that means the, the coefficient for x is 1. And that would be that um, brown or maroon, whatever color that is, curve. If I type in negative 2 sine of x, it graphs right on top of it green, right? So we know we've got that. But some people might say, well, if I take my cosine function, if I take my cosine, I'm just going to draw my cosine, just kind of sketch it a little bit on here. And that would be the cosine, right? Does that make sense? How far do I need to move the cosine to the left for that, that point to go to that point? 90 degrees. So if I say y equals, now the, the amplitude is still 2. That's positive 2 now. Okay? I'm going to go cosine, and you said move left, pi or 2. So how do I demonstrate moving left? Plus, and then I go pi or 2, right? Okay? If I type that in, y equals 2 cosine of x plus pi over 2, does so it give me the same curve? Okay, some people might say, and do it that way. Usually they ask you to like make the smallest phase shift possible. So moving left is that smallest phase shift. But could I have moved that point to right there? How far is that? Three pi two to which direction? Right. Okay. So moving right would be minus three pi or two, right? Type that in, see what that gives us. 2 cosine x minus 3 pi over 2. Same graph, right? 
Okay. Now, why is that the same graph as the blue one? What can I add to this? What are we allowed to add based on what I showed you earlier? You're always allowed to add 2 pi to that, right? If I add 2 pi to that, does it give me that? Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So, when I give you a question like this, and, and I web assign um, will do this. They'll give you a graph and ask you to write an equation. There is going to be additional instructions to that. They're not just say write the equation because we. I think we just demonstrated that we could have. You know, if I've got thirty, I think there's thirty-three of you guys total in the class. First period, second period. If I ask you all to um, write an equation on a test from a graph, I could have 33 different answers, right? And then I would have to go through and make sure that you, I would have to basically do your problem 33 times, or do a unique problem 33 times to grade it. That'd be a pain in the butt. Web assign programming would be the same way. It's going to be a pain in the butt uh, for them to code for their, your answer to match up an infinite number of possible right answers that you have to match up with what they have. So, what they'll do is say, write this curve, write an equation of this curve using sine. Okay? Or maybe you'll say, write the equation of this curve using cosine. Okay? So they'll narrow it down that way. Does that make sense? But we can still see that if they say use cosine, you could have multiple answers, right? If you use sine, you could still have multiple answers. Okay? Because they can take this and just add 2 pi to the x. Okay? Um, so that's a problem. But it's better, okay, because now we're down to one trig function. Then they'll say, write it with your smallest possible horizontal shift or phase shift, okay? Well, in the case of these two, wouldn't this one be the smallest horizontal shift? Pi or 2 is a shorter shift, even though it's to the left, than 3 pi or 2, which is a shift to the right. So with that set of instructions, they'd be looking for that function. That kind of makes sense? Yeah. That's unique to periodic functions. Other, you know, polynomial functions, root functions, um, logarithmic exponentials, they do not have that relationship, okay? Uh, I give you one of those. There's one and only one way of writing those equations, right? Or writing that relationship. Um, recall that? Yeah. All right, let's talk money. I don't want to talk about money. I'm working one shift this week for like four hours, so I'm going to make probably like $39. Don't be impressed. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much fish you pay. You deserve to make sure you get extra money. You haven't earned it. What? What's data matter? Huh? Is there is there an accurate answer to that? Um, I just think I I would think because isn't oh it's fire. Isn't it just, isn't it just like the air heating, like those particles moving back and forth faster and faster and faster? So, so if it's that, then it's just, a, it's just a gas, right? Yeah. Probably ask your science teacher. <laughs> I I don't know why you're it shouldn't be talking about 
it should say amplitude. Yeah. It's the it's the height that the graph is off of the axis that cuts the curve in half. If it's the if the x axis is what cuts it in half. Because you can have vertical you can have vertical shifts that change that a little bit. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So I want to talk, guys. Uh, I want to talk about the uh, the tangent function. Okay. And um, just so that just so that my graphing is a little bit cleaner, uh, I'm going to use um, GeoGebra here. Let's go pi over four. Okay. So I want I want to look at graphing the tangent function. When you guys graph this, uh, as we do this, your graph doesn't need to be so. Everything we've been doing with the sine and cosine, your graph is kind of elongated in the x direction, right? Okay. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way for the tangent. The tangent is going to be um, more of a, you can probably do it more of a square graph. Uh, and if you deviate from that, I would actually elongate it in the y direction. Uh, but it doesn't really have to be. Um, and that's because of how our tangent function repeats itself, okay? It repeats itself a little bit different than the sine and cosine. The sine and cosine don't repeat themselves until you make a complete circle, right? So you get to 2 pi. The tangent's a little bit different, all right? But if we remember what the tangent is from our identities, it is the sine divided by the cosine, right? Okay? So remember, all these ordered pairs here are cosine, comma, sine, right? Yep. So when I want to find the tangent of, let's say, zero degrees or zero radians, it would be sine divided by cosine. So what's zero divided by what? Zero. Zero, okay? So over here, I'm going to have the point zero, zero. That's a key point for our... Um, Tangent function. Okay, I will draft this as we go along, yes. Okay. The the next point, now this one's gonna be harder for you to graph because you gotta have to estimate. Um but the the cosine is radical three oh two, the sine is one half. When I divide those so I'll say tangent of pi over 6. It's going to take that number, 1 half, divided by that number, root 3 over 2. That gives me 1 over radical 3, or radical 3 over 3 if you rationalize it, and that's 0.577 as a decimal. Okay? It's kind of an ugly, like I said, you have to estimate what 0.577 is, right? Okay? But if I graph uh, pi over 6, comma, uh, 1 divided by square root 3, or three, root 3 over 3, gives me that point there. Okay. So, option properties, name and value, name and value. There we go. Okay. So, you got, you, on that one, you got to estimate. Okay. Uh, the next one, though, is pretty nice, right? The tangent of pi over 4. What's the tangent of pi over 4 going to be? 1. 1. Okay. So I'm going to graph the point pi over 4, comma 1. That sounded disgusting. No, I don't want to see you spit that out. Don't do it. Uh, <laughs> he spit that out in the trash can. He didn't even put it in the napkin or anything. You're disgusting. <sighs> All right. Um, so the next, so. so Zero zero, pi over six, root three over three, pi over four, 
Pirate 4, comma 1. Uh, the next one is going to be Pirate 3. And when I divide these, I get root 3 over 2 divided by 1 half. And that's going to be root 3. I get that point there. Okay. Now, when I do this one, at pi over 2, the tangent of pi over 2 is going to be 1 divided by 0. What is that? 1 divided by 0 is undefined. And here's one of the main reasons why college algebra comes in terms of courses before trig, okay, in our progression. What does undefined mean for us graphically when we maybe talk about all our types of equations? Asymptotes, okay? So at pi over 2 here, we have an asymptote, okay? So I'm going to draw, and, and at the vertical asymptote, so I write x equals pi over 2. And it didn't graph it. X equals pi over 2. There we go. So there's my asymptote. Is that okay, everybody? Um, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, next period. Hopefully, don't rock the time. I'll get it up. The, the key points up there, okay? Would you agree that zero, zero is pretty easy to plot? Would you agree that one kind of sucks plotting? Yes. Okay? So I'm going to keep it there for now, but you, when we do this on a test or quiz or when we do transformations with these, you would not plot that point generally. Okay? It's much like if I'm taking x squared. I want, I want to graph x squared. Would I graph 1 half comma 1 fourth? No. No. I'd go 1, 1, 2, 4, or those, right? But if I get those correct, then one half, one fourth should fall in line where it should be, right? Okay. Is this one a nice one to graph? Power four comma one. Yeah. yeah. And the real nice part of it is where does that power four happen in regards to this zero and this asymptote? Halfway. Halfway. There's some symmetry there with that point. So I'm gonna color that point red. That's a, that's a key point. Color this point here. That's red. That's a key point. Okay. That one there. Okay, root 3, 1.73. You don't want to find that on the y-axis, right? Okay. Um, so that's not a really nice one to, to plot. But if I'm graphing the tangent function, I've got to go through these four points, right? Yeah. My curve has to pass through those. And when I get closer and closer to an asymptote, this point is closer than that one, this one is closer than that one, this blue one is closer than these three. As we're getting closer and closer to that asymptote, you're going up, right? Okay. I'm going to graph right now just the tangent of x for x, just if x is between 0 and pi over 2. Let's go tangent of x. So I'm going to connect those with that smooth curve. Is that all right? Okay. Now, the tangent function is a little bit unique in regards to what we've already talked about with the sine and cosine. <clears throat> the sine and cosine, we would normally continue going around into the second quadrant, third quadrant, fourth quadrant to get the rest of the curve, right? And we can do that, but it makes more sense actually uh, to go back to zero, zero, and now move this direction, move negative pi over uh, six, negative pi over four, negative pi over three, negative pi over two. That kind of makes sense. So I'm going to look at this point here. Okay, at negative pi over six, you're going to have that y value divided by that x value, right? And that ends up being negative square root of three over three. It gives me that point. Negative pi over six, negative square root of three over three. Gives me that point right there. Okay? Is that point? Uh, let's see here if we can do this. Rotate that point around that point. Let's go A. I 
don't know where that slider went that I put in there. Uh, but if I want to take that point right there, rotate it 180 degrees, it's going to go to that point. Does that make sense? Okay. Maybe I can prove that to you by putting a circle here. This is that M on the so M prime, rotate 180 degrees, which still show up on the circle. Both those points are on that circle, right? Is there a diameter that goes from M prime to that point right there through zero, zero? Make sense? So that's proof to me that that point right there is has origin symmetry with that point right there. Tell me the tangent function is an odd function. So if it's an odd function and I have these points, then I should be able to negate both of these and get another point down here. Does that make sense? Okay. Or if I don't want to use that property, I can just keep working around the unit circle. And when I get to pi over four, I want to have negative root two over root, or negative root two over two divided by root two over two, and that's going to give me what? When I divide those two red points, that's going to give me negative one, right? So at negative pi over four, I'm at negative one. At negative pi over three, we're going to be at negative square root of three. And where are we going to be at when we get to negative pi over two? What's negative 1 divided by 0 going to give me? An asymptote. So again, at x equals negative pi over 2, you have another asymptote. Okay. Now, I'm going to graph if x is between negative pi over 2 to 0, I'm going to graph the tangent function again and I can finish off that curve, right? But do you guys see that that red curve is a rotation around the origin to produce that purple one, right? Okay. When we do this, when we graph the tangent function, you are not going to graph that point or that point, that one or that one. You're simply going to graph graph that one, zero, zero, and that one, and your asymptotes. And those are the three points and two asymptotes that are part of your parent function for tangent. Does that make sense? You've got parent function points for sine and cosine. These are the parent points in, in the accompanying asymptotes to get your tangent, okay? Now, as I graph the tangent further, and I don't restrict the domain, would you agree that we get kind of what we have is this, we, we call this, a lot of times you might hear it be called, I go negative pi over 2 to x to pi over 2. Look at that blue region. That's the fundamental period of your tangent function, meaning that is the part that you are going to cut and paste to create the next part, and cut and paste that to create the next part. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the fundamental period for sine and cosine is 0 to 2 pi. The fundamental period for tangent is negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, because that's where we start to see the complete, continuous um, graphing of the tangent function. If we were kept going around the unit circle uh, from like we started at zero, went to pi or two, and we were going to pi, we would have graphed, uh, so let's go zero is less than x is less than pi. We would have graphed that blue thing, and if I'm just looking at that blue stuff there, I would have only had that little arc and that little arc, okay, or I don't know what you call them. I only just kept calling them arcs, branches. Um, and um, that's not a complete cycle of the tangent function. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's why we start at negative pi over 2 and work to pi over 2. Questions on that? All right. Um, period for the tangent function is pi. Okay. The nice thing about this, so when we talk about doing transformations, if I have y equals uh, like a, so I can, I can still stretch it, 
I'm going to put the tangent here. I should still have a B value uh, that is out in front of my argument. You still move it left and right. You still move it up and down. Okay. That B value, remember when it was sine and cosine, it dictated the period, right? And the period was 2 pi divided by that B. Well, because the tangent period is pi, that is what you would have to do to uh, transform a tangent function. Okay. So just uh, let's take a moment here. Let's put a new. Oh, let's do a new window here. If I were to ask you guys to just graph. Let's go tangent of 2x. Just make a, a really easy one real quick. x-axis, pi over 2. Okay. So if I want to graph tangent of 2x, the first thing we have to realize is that that 2 is our b value, right? So the period is going to be pi over 2 in this case. Well, in order to get that period of pi or 2, which is not the normal period of pi, right? The normal period would happen between those two things. That's a period of pi, okay? Now my period is pi or 2. So now my period is going to happen between those. Does that make sense? What would this, what would this x value right there be? Negative pi or 4. That one's going to be positive pi or 4, right? On the original tangent function, okay, if that's pi over 2, so on the parent function, that's pi over 2, halfway, we were at a height of 1, right? So halfway between 0 and pi over 2, you're at a height of 1. Now, halfway in between, which would be at pi over 8, right, that's where you're going to be at 1. Halfway in between over here, you're going to be at negative 1. Does that make sense, everybody? So now if we put in our... Try not to, I'll try not to move this stuff. Uh, but if I type in tangent of 2x here, does that orange curve go through that point there, that blue point, that blue point, 0, 0? Does it look like our asymptotes or x equals pi over uh, 4 and negative pi over 4? Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Uh, so the symmetry that exists here when you either com when you compress it and you do a horizontal shrink it's like you're putting your hands on both asymptotes and pushing them together and the symmetry should still be maintained okay if i'm going to do a horizontal stretch so that means my b value would be a, be a fraction between 0 and 1 then it'd be like i put my hands on my asymptotes and i pull it apart but the symmetry should still exist this point right here is always going to be halfway between your asymptote and your intercept. Does that make sense? Same thing over here. So, so then you got the odd symmetry. Um, so then that point is the same with that asymptote and your intercept. Okay. Um, let's talk about, let me just close all this stuff down real quick, restart it. So that's the tangent. So what, what functions do we, we need to talk about yet? Uh, cosecant and? Okay, so uh, we do need to talk about the, the inverses. We'll, we'll do that much later in the week. Um, so let's talk about the secant and cosecant. Which one do we do first? Cosecant. So what's the cosecant the reciprocal of? Sine. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to put my sine function in over here real quick. Uh, and I'm just going to do it for one period. So 0 to 2 pi of the sine function. Okay, so we have that thing right there, right? If I ask to determine...
the reciprocal of these. Okay, so right there is zero, uh, zero. That point is a so sine of zero, zero radian. Sine of zero radians gives me a y value of zero, right? Okay, so now if I go cosecant of zero radians, it should be the reciprocal of that number right there, correct? Well, zero is zero divided by any number, right, as a fraction? A lot of times people put one there. So what would be the reciprocal of that? One over zero, which is undefined. So what does that tell me? that for the cosecant I have right there. I have an asymptote, okay? Um, so let's type in, let's type in x equals zero here. And I gotta do it on this side. x equals zero. So with that asymptote, um, make it red, okay? So there's an asymptote there, okay? What about, and I'm just going to skip to this next intercept right here, okay? Because that is the sine of pi, right? The sine of pi, if we look at our unit circle, sine of pi is that zero right there, right? What is the reciprocal of that zero? What was the reciprocal of zero up here? Yeah, it's still undefined, right? So what's that tell me I have a pi? Another asymptote. So x equals pi, another asymptote, okay? Where do you think, just looking at what we've done so far, what do you think I'm going to have at two pi? Another asymptote, okay? So, what happens is for the cosecant function, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to actually graph its reciprocal. You're going to graph the sine function. And you're going to find the zeros. Okay? And the zeros or the x-intercepts are where I have vertical asymptotes. Is it okay? Okay? Now, would you guys agree that pi over 2, comma 1, is a nice point for the sine function? Right? That y value, so, so sine... The sine of pi over 2 is equal to 1, right? The cosecant of pi over 2 is equal to the reciprocal of that number. What's the reciprocal of 1? 1, okay? So the next thing you're going to do once you find your asymptote is you're going to find that maximum because that maximum right there is a point on your cosecant. What do you think this minimum is? Same thing, right? Reciprocal of negative 1 is negative 1. So I'll have 3 pi over 2, comma negative 1, and now we'll get a point. So right now, our parent function parts for the cosecant are these three asymptotes and those two maximums and minimums, okay? Now, just real quick, what is, because I have to figure out what is happening inside this function, inside these asymptotes, um, what is the sign of, let's say, pi over 6. 1 half, right? What is the cosecant, then, of pi over 6? 2, okay? Pi over 6 is, like, right here, right? 2 would be there, right? If I graph that point, pi over 6, comma 2, okay? That point right there, right? As I go from this point to that point, am I able to jump over that red asymptote? No. Okay. And if I ask you what the um, the sign of five pi or six would be over here, it's going to be one half. The reciprocal would be two. Does that make sense? So when I graph the cosecant, so I'll say if x is between 0 and 2 pi, graph the cosecant of x, 
that purple curve, and both of them are my cosecant. Does that make sense? And the quick way of generating that, first thing is find your asymptotes, and those are found at the zeros of the sine function. Find the maximums and minimums of the sine function, because then they are the opposite maximum minimum for the cosecant. So if it's a maximum on the sine, it's actually a local minimum for the cosecant, right? If it was a minimum for the sine, it's a local maximum for the cosecant. Once I find those two points, then I'm going to move to the left, and I'm going to graph to the left towards this asymptote, and I have to go up, okay? And I, I get sucked towards that asymptote. And then when I go to the right, I go up again and get sucked towards that asymptote. And then the same thing happens over here. I start at that point right there, that minimum on the sine function, and I move left, and I graph that part, sucking towards that asymptote, and I move to the right. And that thing then should, because if the sine function is periodic on 2 pi, the cosecant is periodic with 2 pi. So if I graph the whole cosecant function, that is the entire cosecant function from negative infinity to positive infinity. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, what is the sine related to the cosine? By, by horizontal shift, right? Yeah. So will the secant be related to the cosecant by a horizontal shift? Probably. Yes. Okay. Uh, I posted a homework assignment yesterday. Make sure you keep looking at that or start looking at that. Blaze, you got a question? Yeah. 